Why should I find him here and not in a church? Nor yet where nature heaves a breast like Olivet against the stars. I peer upon his footsteps in this quarried mud. I see his blood in rusty stains on pit props, wagon frames, bristling with nails, not leaves. There were no leaves upon his chosen tree. No parasitic flowering over shames of Eden's primal infidelity. Just splintered wood and nails were fairest blossoming for him who speaks where mica silt outbreaks, like water from the side of his own clay in that strange day when he was pierced. Here still the earth face pales and rends in earthquake roarings of a blast with tainted rock outcast, while fields and woods lie dreaming yet of peace twixt God and his creation, of release from potent wrath, a faith that waxes bold in churches nestling snugly in the fold of scented hillsides where mild shadows brood, the dark and stubborn mood of him whose feet are bare upon this mire, and in the furnace fire which hardens all the clay that has escaped, would not be understood by worshippers of beauty toned and shaped to flower or him. I know their facile praise, false to the heart of me, which like this pit must still be disemboweled of nature's stain and rendered fit by violent mouldings through the tunnelled ways of all he would regain. I didn't understand Jack's writing one little bit. As time has gone on, and we have been having Jack Clemmer Memorial Days here in June each year, and some people who have studied Jack's writing come along and read to us, interspersed with comments by people who remember Jack. And now I'm uh, getting quite fond of reading Jack uh, occasionally. My mother went to school with Jack, and uh, I can remember her saying that um, the teachers were always holding up his, eff his uh, essays that he wrote and saying how wonderful they were. But uh, then she'd heard he'd won this award for his poetry, and she couldn't understand that because she said, well, all he write about is a load of rubbish, she thought. <laughs> you know? I think a lot of the locals, if I'm really truthful, Jack was the poet up the road, the writer up the road. Um, but on the other hand, you will have uh, found a number of poems that he wrote particularly about this chapel um, for certain special events and so on. And he describes the chapel and its location and its close proximity to the clay works in great detail. A bleak spot was chosen where narrow lanes twisted irritably down to a stream and narrow lives twisted irritably down to death's river. Build here, said the guides, a chapel whose straight-spurred walls will curb the crooked ways. The surrounding plough scars sang their parable. Soon the good seed flashed from its solemn cover. The cramped valley had its fold of praise. Beyond living memory, the uncouth voices above long beards and frock coats poured the pure grain. In Victorian sunshine, fog or smoky lamp rays, over the full pews, over veils and bonnets, mouldy muffs, ragged shawls and men's caps, smelling of hayrick or kiln fumes shoved under the boards. How many hands in this century have plucked deep waves of mystery from those organ keys, prompting the love thrill, the clasp of God's glory in melodious searches, ripples of Roman chords. Classic touch, trained choirs were to trace the reaper's track after the crude preachers. Under the same grey roof, rough dialect and elegant cadence bore the golden story. Roots of my story quiver in this corner guarding Bethel. 
I think how my bubbly, field-toughened grandfather clapped and shouted behind the pulpit, and how a grave-toned minister marked the ablation on my face as my infant eyes blinked at the communion rail. And there, fifty-odd years later, I spoke vows at the end of a twisted lane where I entered, bride-blessed, a straight, spurred union. Of course, we used to worship every Sunday morning, back again after lunch for Sunday school, back again after tea for evening service. I can't say that I was the keenest person on earth to be here three times a day, to be truthful. And um, there would be occasions on which it would be absolutely tipping down with rain. And I used to say to my mother, I don't think I'll go to chapel tonight because um, it's raining and everything else. And my mother's reply was, Mrs. Clemo and Jack have just walked around the corner. They're soaking wet. If they can do it, so can you. Put your Mac on and get out. So I came. Evelyn, Jack's mother, was, I think to children, could appear to be quite a formidable woman. She wasn't full of laughs and jokes, but she was really quite serious. We all see people in different lights. I saw her as being a woman who'd had a hard life, a woman who would give anything, a woman who put everything into uh, looking after Jack, a woman who could look a bit stern, but somehow there was a presence about her that I sort of appreciated. I came to Cornwall in 1947 to live with Mrs. Clemo and Jack, who immediately told me to call her mum, and Jack was my brother. I should say, within an hour at least, I was at the top of the Sambora, next to the cottage, <laughs> with Jack. She was She's very kind. Girl. Yeah. We weren't terribly keen on school lunches, so mum used to make pasties on a Wednesday, and we would leave school at lunchtime and then she would leave home around the same time and we'd meet halfway and sit on the hedge, and Jack as well, and eat these pasties and she'd have a flask of tea there for us, all hot drinks, and then we'd go our way back to school and they'd go home. And that used to just take up one of the days that we didn't like school dinners. <laughs> My first recollection of Jack was we discovered he had a typewriter. And my brother, Reg, was taken prisoner at the fall of Singapore. And the Japanese would not allow handwritten letters. It had to be typed. And Jack was the only one we knew that had a typewriter. And we were only allowed to write to him twice a year. So when the time was due, my sister and I would go up and Jack would type out the draft letter that we'd prepared. And that's how I got to know Jack. This is a book written by Jack, Confession of a Rebel, which he wanted to call Confession of a Misfit, but his publisher didn't agree with his title, in which there used to be a photograph. It's a photograph of Jack and his little dog, Flush. That was before Spark, I believe. And he's written to Brenda, who appears on pages and lists all the page numbers from your old Gunnamara's playmate, Jack, in which he writes... Brenda and Sheila were by this time very good friends of mine. They brought the authentic village tang, the tang of the soil, Sheila was a dark, solid girl, sometimes a little reserved. Brenda, on the other hand, was an unpredictable tomboy, almost as willful and moody as I was, and therefore very lovable. He did call me an unpredictable tomboy, and he wasn't over keen on my sister. He called her dark. She was very, very reserved. But the reason that he called me unpredictable was because none of them ever knew what I was going to get up to next. The top of the sandbar, next to the cottage, where the skip was removed, the track was still there, along with a lot of galvanoise. 
and I used to sit on the golf noise and shoot down the track. When I was nearly at the bottom, I would jump off because there was several feet of water in the quarry and I couldn't swim. I went ahead and when he saw what nearly happened, because, I mean, the, the galvanised used, always used to go down into the water. I mean, there must be scores and scores of sheets of galvanised in that quarry still. But when I turned around after I jumped off, I looked and he chickened out. He was still sitting there. He used to come out with it when all the children came up and um, when we went out to play and he'd hold the skipping rope for us all to skip and everything. So, I mean, I had a lot of patience when I think about it. And there was one instance when um, he was getting on my nerves a bit that particular day. I think he was getting irritated because we were making him hold the rope and one thing and another and uh, bend over for leapfrog. <laughs> and uh, I opened the coal ice door and he went in and I locked him in there. We went in for our tea and Mum said, where's Jack? No, he must have gone for a walk. Anyway, <laughs> eventually, I said to her, yeah, no, I've locked him in the coal house. She was a little bit annoyed, but I went out and let him out, and he came out like a raging bull. <laughs> in a field on which the sand dumps spilt a vomit of gravel where grasses wilt, my ice world broke for an hour of flame with one who shared it in childish game. We romped in the sun, but the warmth I felt came only from her, as she tried to pelt my face into smiles with orange peel. <laughs> I remember that morning. It was the end of the 40s. And there was still food rationing. And somehow or other, I don't know how she managed it, but Mother got hold of a Jaffa orange, which we hadn't seen any during the war. And she gave it to me to take out. I think it was Joan and Irene and Sheila and Jack and I. And we sat on the corner of the field and I peeled it, divided it into equal numbers of pasties. When I came to Jack's share, I pretended that there wasn't any left and all he could have was the peel. I kept his share behind my back until afterwards, when I actually gave it to him. She skinned the fruit with her teeth, would steal close up, undeterred by the threatened smack. Her hand curled tightly behind her back, her hand clenched warm on the missiles broken, growing soft and moist with her blood's shy token. But when that book came out and I read that, I just couldn't believe it, that he'd remembered it as well. But he seems to remember a lot more about it than me. I couldn't communicate with Jack. Um, his mother, and latterly Ruth, had the means of communicating by writing on his palm, as you know. Um, and they would tell Jack what it was all about, and then he would ad address his comments to, uh, to you. She would write on his knee if I went to talk, and he would talk to you then. But he was always very, very quiet and... I always appeared to be very polite and kind. He walked with a little bit of a stoop. As I say, he was bound to be a bit quiet. He couldn't hear, he couldn't see much. When he was going blind, he, used, he had a piece of card that he painted black and he had a, like a slit through it so that he could read the words of a book or whatever he was always writing or anything. And he used to put it down and just read through there. Mm. So, but that, I mean, after a few years, obviously his sight went and he, he didn't know that anymore. I had somebody that come to stay with me and the little girl was born blind and I took them over to see Jack. I can remember him sitting in the chair when I went in and he held her and uh, gave her a little, little book. I think it was the uh, birth of Jesus, a little book done in Braille so that she could read when she got older. It was just a tiny little room, really, and bookshelves with all Jack's books and that in there. And Jack's desk was in there, and that's where he used to sit. And there was just a little settee in there and an organ. 
which mum used to teach lessons on. And uh, then there was suspense, which I, I said, I didn't even know what they were talking about, but she used to say, you go in there to wash. And then um, you'd go up the stairs, and there was a quite a large front bedroom, I think where Mum and Jack slept. And then there was the back bedroom where my sister and I slept. Mm-hmm. Then there was the stairs with the planks across. Jack used to go up and sit up there in the dark because I think the lights used to hurt his eyes. Yeah, that, that was the cottage, really. We've got a magnificent model downstairs built by Mr Andy Hawken of Indian Queens. We asked for a small model of the cottage and it took six of us to carry it in and put it in the memorial room. It's a magnificent model and uh, we're very, very pleased to have it. It's actually made of stone that came from the old cottage, slate uh, from the roof of the old cottage, uh, and it couldn't be more authentic than that, could it? Well, I cycled past it quite a lot when I was younger. I had an aunt who lived at Foxhall, and I was sent over there on errands. And uh, my memory, of course, of the cottage at that time was that Jack was very fond of a Pomeranian dog. In fact, he had two of them. And uh, these dogs used to run up and down uh, the hedge outside the cottage. And the road then went right past that hedge. And uh, one found oneself cycling faster just along that piece of road than any other part of the journey. Not that one was terribly afraid of a Pomeranian, but it didn't have to make a lot of noise. I always thought it was a little dark in there, but that may have been, of course, because of Jack's the sight problems. Um, a lowly sort of cottage, but um, it, it kind of felt homely even to a young lad. The cottage was owned by Gundwin and Rastaurik China Clay Company, still on their land, obviously, and uh, it was not habitable and it was decided by the management to demolish it and use the site to build laboratories on. A lot of people were not happy about that, but that's eventually what happened to it. Once people knew that cottage was going, there was almost a little revolution. You know, verbally, people were annoyed, letters to the paper, phone calls up there and so on, uh, as we found. Um, And one or two uh, people associated with the chapel had worked for that company. They were furious, absolutely furious. Now, they had every right to knock it down. You know, I was interviewed by the paper and I said, they've done nothing wrong. They owned a building, it wasn't habitable. They had tried to keep it habitable, but it wasn't. The council had condemned it for human occupation. So they were quite entitled to knock it down. On the other side, we've now knocked down a part of Cornish heritage. I know it's no good wishing For what can never be But I just can't help a thinking Of those happy days with thee Well, I just remember that uh, it used to come with his mother and uh, I suppose they walked at the time, she would walk anyway, but later on we had a rotor of cars and we would go to fetch them to come to chapel and then take them home afterwards. Jack used to sit about two thirds of the way back over there. He would sit to the right of his wife and uh, he would hold his hand out like this and she would write in his hand the things that was being said. Usually at the end of the service, you'd go back and shake hands. And I suppose you must have put a J in this thing because he would you know, hold his hand up and say, oh, hello, Jennifer, and how are you? Something like that. I didn't write on his hand a lot. It was more Fran and, and Mum Clemmer. But on the occasions I did, he, he, he knew what you were going to... He seemed to know what you were going to say before you even said it, you know. Jack was naturally quiet, but he was... Uh interesting to listen to and you could have a conversation say i was just going to write um raymond just his name i just put ra and he'd say right away raymond Mm. he could answer you before you'd finished asking him the question 
Yeah. It was that intuitive. You know, to lose one of your five main senses is bad enough, but to lose two, and probably the two most important, is a rough deal. We often wonder if he would have written the same way if he could see, but he had seen these things and then he could remember and, uh, and write about it from his memories. Would Jack have been writing it the way he did if he wasn't blind and deaf? And I think it's a good question which we will never know the answer to. We really didn't take that much notice then at that age, you don't do you? And I didn't even know that he'd written the book, to be quite honest, not then. And I haven't been there all the time while he was writing these books and things. All I can remember is the manuscripts that he used to write and he'd pile them up in a big pile on the desk and then he'd sort out what he wanted and the rest he'd give to me to draw on. This is a bureau or the bureau on which Jack did a lot of his writing. These are genuine berries that Jack used to wear. He was very fond of wearing them. These garments were given to us by Ruth, and this uh, came to us from uh, Will Martin Clay Museum. I mean, it was just normal to them to look at the clay tips, but he had these, these, all these magnificent words, and wherever all the words came from, I, do, I don't know. But um, yes, he had a wonderful, wonderful mind. I met a lady who's no longer with us either, who lived on the bypass in St. Orsall, who taught Jack to type. And she said, um, I got him a Braille typewriter. And his answer was, I'm not using that. Nothing wrong with me. And he did. He learned to type by counting the keys along and hitting them, you know. But no, he wasn't going to play with a Braille typewriter. So it was a determination in Jack, I think which I still think comes from his mother, because I think she was a strong woman, very strong woman. She used to really <laughs> do a lot of nice things for us. Mm -hmm. She always made her own cream. She, in the morning, she'd put the milk on top of the um, Cornish range, and it would cook, you know, warm very slowly. And by tea time, you had thick clot of cream. That was lovely. <laughs> so we, we always had clot of cream, well, practically every day. That, that so cream went on everything, that. cabbage, turnip, everything. Quite honestly, Evelyn Clamp um, had a tough life. Um, she lost her husband uh, in the First World War. I don't suppose income uh, was very great. And I think she did so, so much on so, so little. We always had lovely Christmas days. Mm. We used to go um, well, walk halfway to this church, going down the hill, and cut the Christmas tree, which was a holly tree in the hedge. Jack used to cut it, he used to saw it, and then we'd take it back home and we'd decorate it. This is usually Christmas Eve, and we'd put all our own decorations on that we'd all made. And um, then in the evening, we'd sit by a roaring fire, and she'd bring out all the nuts, fruit, and everything you could think of. And she used to say, just help yourself, have as much as you want, and if you make a mess, don't worry about it. It'll all be cleaned up in the morning, and it was. <laughs> it was lovely. It was a lovely, homely, family Christmas. I mean, she did everything for him, and we did wonder what on earth would happen to Jack when she died. But of course, then this uh, Ruth suddenly turned up out of the blue, which was just like a miracle, really. Jack and Ruth were married here at Trezosa. This is a photograph of that wedding. This is Charles Causley. Causley, he was quite friendly with Jack and he was his best man at his wedding. Miskin, he was, he was a mystery. <laughs> Put it that way. I didn't like his pa paintings personally. I thought they looked cruel. I think they made them Jack and Mum look very harsh and hard. And they weren't like that at all. They were both very gentle people. It was one of their summer trips down to our house and um, we decided to go to Drudden Steps. And uh, we got to the top of the steps and Ruth and Jack were insistent on going down. It was quite dangerous. And anyway, we decided to go down. I went first, Jack was in the middle and Ruth followed on behind, trying to keep him in. And anyway, we got onto the beach and the tide was running quite high. And Jack, being blind and deaf, he couldn't 
visualise what was going on. And he was up to his knees in the water, and of course the waves were coming in, and I was getting frantic. <laughs> I thought he was going to drown. And anyway, we managed to get him back on the beach and get, got him dry. And uh, we got him back up the steps again, which was quite some task. And Mum and I were at the top, <laughs> practically having kittens, because we knew that it was very dangerous with them coming up. And when he got up there, he had a seagull's feather in his hand, didn't he? Mm. He gave it to Mum. Mm. <laughs> so she'd be really pleased with the seagull's feather when she was really worried about him falling over the steps. Mm. But he was soaking, wasn't he, up to his waist, practically. <laughs> he thought it was hilarious. <laughs> yeah, he loved it. Mm. So. Yeah. I suppose it's the same theory with most writers, artists and so on, they're perhaps better respected and better understood after they've gone than they were when they were here. It was quite remarkable that you had, on special occasions, the chapel completely filled, the gallery filled, the vestry filled, then chairs in the aisle, which I think probably the fire officer today would not be very happy about, so we could conceivably say that what with the choir as well, we would probably have something like 280 plus people in this chapel. The whole building would be f absolutely full. The windows of the vestry would be taken down. There'd be chairs there, that was full. And when we were little, we would have uh, little roses. A man called Mr. West down the road would bring a rose for us to pin on our dresses. I was born at Stepaside, which is about half a mile down the road from here, and um, lived here until I was uh, not quite 16, when I went to work in Bristol. And when I came back, uh, things had changed. Chapel-going habits had uh, died out. We've got um, about 11 on a Sunday morning, if we were um, all here. Well, we've got no children, no Sunday school here, so there's no anniversaries anymore. And once the television came in, then um, people had other things to do. But before that, this was the main focus of the week, church and chapel. Like most chapels, um, we find it difficult to um, raise sufficient money to keep the chapel uh, uh, open for worship. We pledged uh, that we would as long as we could, and that pledge remains. Inevitably, chapels and churches are closing, and one day that's going to have to happen to us too. Things have just changed. I can't honestly say it's changed for the better. Warplanes have crossed the dale, sparing the stubborn roof, though creeping apathy stripped the pews, closed the gallery. Time ripens, Time bereaves, but we can rejoice with the traveller whose wintry plough scars sang towards the sheaves. Oh 